gonna die today? Would you be uh, ready for it? Like, would you feel uh, at peace with your life? Yes and no. So how do you get to just yes? You don't. See, holding two incompatible ideas in your head at the same time and accepting both of them, well, that's the best of being human. Yes, no, good, bad, life, death. Wax on, wax off. When season two of Russian Doll hit Netflix this April, I was super intrigued by the promotional material. So out of curiosity and boredom, I googled the show, wondering whether it would be up my alley. The synopsis read, a cynical young woman in New York keeps dying and returning to the party that's being thrown in her honor on that same evening. She tries to find a way out of this strange time loop. And that was enough to have me sold. I love a good existential sci-fi mystery. Natasha Lyonne, not only the star, but one of the show's creators, writers, and executive producers as well, has stated on multiple occasions that their list of references for the show is endless, and it shows. I'd kind of grown up sort of thinking in terms of sort of layering concepts. Oh, yeah. Like, and, remember when you told me that? Yeah. When you were like, oh, I'm going eight rabbis deep. Like, yeah. when we were, <laughs> like you know what? We would be talking about yeah. something creative. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then, you know, I kind of be like, oh, yeah, you know, what about this thing? And then you, I would see you going like yeah. eight rabbis deep into the, you know, the questioning. Well, that, I actually think you know. that sometimes that the the, right, the reason it's hitting on such a big level is because like Leslie was raised with too much religion on the Jesus side and yep. I was raised with too much religion on the Jew side. And yeah. as a result, we're kind of hitting you from all sides. <laughs> and, like all of your childhood traumas in any direction are in play in any given time. And yeah. Um, I, I brought in that Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning, oh, yeah. which is really, you know, invented the term logotherapy and sort of it's about his like survival through Auschwitz. My grandparents are Holocaust survivors. Like this idea that I think Leslie and I were really interested in, which is, you know, what is it to kind of come back from self-destruction and make the decision that you want to become a participating member of life? Created and executively produced by Leon, Amy Poehler, and Leslie Headland, the show went through many phases and ideas before landing at Netflix, starting as a TV pilot titled Old Soul back in 2014, through a lot of hard work and time blossomed into one of Netflix's best original shows. We get to see Natasha Lyonne in her prime as she plays a sort of tethered version of herself. Russian Doll is not her life story though, don't get me wrong. In a profile with the LA Times, Lyonne spoke to Ivan Villarreal about this distinction. One of the stories about the show is how much it's me personally, Lyonne says, alluding to her chaotic childhood and history with addiction. It's been my life experience that there's a lot of stuff that we don't talk about or that we're ashamed of, family histories and stuff like that, and it's not actually as rare as we like to pretend. The only thing I could tell you about my family is that there's such extreme character studies that I think as a writer, as a director, as an actor, as a producer, it's given me a huge window into the human condition more than I'm exercising personal demons through my work. In other words, as she later quips, no, my mother did not give birth to me on the subway tracks at Astor Place Station while I was time traveling. Season one is near perfect, with season two being a great follow-up, but not a phenomenal one. I enjoyed both seasons and bawled my eyes out during both for various reasons, but the second season does feel a bit disjointed, with one of the main characters being sidelined as if the writers were unsure how to continue his overarching story. I have my critiques and we'll get to them for sure, but that being said, I absolutely love this show. Russian Doll is a masterclass in genre bending with a captivating, suspenseful storyline and charismatic characters that keep you watching. Leon gives a standout performance, but so does Charlie Barnett as Alan Zavery, who comes into season one as a surprise main character. 
At its core, the show is an incredibly rich text that compels you to watch more than just once. It explores the hard truths of the human experience. They don't shy away from tackling heavy themes, death, addiction, intergenerational trauma, religion, the Holocaust, mental health, and motherhood. While the writers and creators explore these topics head on, the show avoids feeling reductive or derivative. The pacing keeps you hooked. Even in the moments we see coming, the writers still manage to subvert our expectations. They skip the typical exposition dumping dialogue that sci-fis are known for, leaving most theoretical concepts vague or up to the viewer's interpretation. You don't have to understand string theory to follow along. Through the cinematography, set design, lighting, and editing tricks, Russian Doll speaks a language anyone can understand. And the music? I mean, it may just be one of the best parts about the show. Many would label the series a dark comedy, and while there is a lot of humor, the tone effortlessly sways from feeling existential to humorous to unnerving. Production's use of liminal spaces like elevators, stairwells, empty homes, subways, and empty voids dramatically enhances that in-between feeling. And the characters? They feel lived in. They feel fleshed out. While we can laugh about the shit they go through, we can also cry about it. We can also fear it. And in this wide range of emotions, we can easily put ourselves in their shoes every single time. Today, I'll be dissecting the show's recurring themes and most compelling moments, exploring some of the deepest questions it asks of us. My name is Joe, and this is With Nuance, a visual and audio essay series where we dissect all things media from a socio-political lens. If you're subscribed and we already know each other, welcome back, and if you're new here, I'm gonna uh, ask you to hit that subscribe button, especially if you love deep dives exploring all things pop culture. Consider supporting my Patreon for early releases, producer credits, script access, and live Q&As. Contributions from patrons help me with purchasing equipment, hiring collaborators, and producing more videos. Head over to the link in the description to make a monthly pledge for as low as $3. Now, if you haven't already seen the series, I suggest you stop watching this video now and go watch before I start dissecting and theorizing. It's definitely not a show that you want spoiled. I promise the twists and turns are such a treat and it's so satisfying to come up with your own theories while watching. If you're still here, I'm gonna assume you've already seen the show or you have no plans to watch. So for those who need some background or a refresher, let's set the scene. Nadia Volvikov, played by Natasha Lyon, is a young software engineer celebrating her 36th birthday. She's a chain-smoking badass, undoubtedly an Aries like her real-life tether, a flawed yet enviable protagonist. We're first introduced to her in the bathroom of her birthday party, which quickly becomes the show's checkpoint to convey the time loop that she'll find herself stuck in. Every time she dies, she reappears in this mystical-ass bathroom. Her first death is by taxi, then by drowning, and later on by falling down the stairs repeatedly. She has no idea what's going on, initially thinking that there's some mind-blowing drug in the joint that her friend Maxine rolled, played by Greta Lee. She can't comprehend how she keeps dying and coming back to life in Maxine's bathroom and starts to think it's all some sort of sick joke. Sweet birthday, baby! Having fun? The it's universe like is trying to fuck with me, and I refuse to engage. Do you hear me? I won't do it! And I don't give a fuck if you disappeared my cat! Almost halfway through the first season, we get a brilliant reveal that Nadia is not the only person experiencing this death loop. We meet Alan Zavery, played by Charlie Barnett, at the end of episode three, and surprise, he's been dying and coming back to life too. Hey, man, didn't you get the news? Where are you? 
we're about to die. It doesn't matter, I die all the time. But instead of reliving his birthday party, he gets to relive his girlfriend breaking up with him on the night he plan to propose. Alan is not necessarily a less flawed protagonist, but he is Nadia's foil in many ways. He has many neurodivergent qualities, tending to obsess over life's every minor detail. He's striving so hard for perfection and partnership, whereas Nadia is striving for the opposite. They're complete strangers, but in an unlikely scenario, their deaths are inexplicably linked, forcing them to work together to solve this mystery. The premise itself puts our main characters through physical deaths in order for them to explore a metaphorical one, all while being pushed to navigate larger themes that are triggering for them. We watch over and over as they experience an inescapable manifestation of their own mental purgatory, forced to relive the same scenarios they're desperately trying to escape until they stop running and face the root of their biggest problem why they both feel so disconnected from life and when that started. While Nadia's first death is an accident, it's later revealed that Alan's first death was a suicide. This puts an interesting dichotomy on display, symbolizing how one's complete lack of concern or too much concern can represent their detachment from life. Initially, they don't know why they keep responding after their deaths, and the show follows them as they try to figure that out. The creators have stated it's a sort of choose-your-own-adventure video game, and you definitely get that feeling the more you see them go through this process. Getting back to their lives is not easy or completely at will for our main characters. Initially, they both fight this loop in different ways, but because of outside circumstances like the universe disappearing people and pets, learning of betrayals like infidelity, and gaining new perspectives on grief, the universe pushes them to their limits to evoke a true rebirth. Throughout the season, Nadia and Alan are constantly coming in contact with their loved ones in ways that elicit introspection. In particular, Ruth, played by Elizabeth Ashley, often acts as a therapeutic guide for Nadia. As a therapist and the woman who partially raised Nadia, Ruth offers comfort and reassurance to our characters navigating this crisis. Each rebirth that Alan and Nadia go through requires them to peel back another layer of their existence, connecting to their innermost consciousness. By episode 7, this idea takes even a literal form when Nadia starts hallucinating a physical manifestation of her inner child. It's not too hard to see why the show is called Russian Doll. In the season finale, Nadia and Alan are sent back to their original timelines. The twist is, the timelines they're sent to are not the same. They end up back where they were on the night they first died, where they happened to cross paths without knowing each other. Hey, Farad! Nadia! Show us some of your best condoms! Alan! Alan, are you okay? Hey, so happy to see you. I'm so glad you're alive. <laughs> you know, give me a little space, hippie. Nice scarf. Oh, oh fuck. fuck. Just as we're expecting the plot to resolve itself, the writers subvert our expectations by raising the stakes once more. The final episode follows Nadia and Alan as they both try to save the other from dying, plagued with the task of convincing each other that they do, in fact, know each other. It's a phenomenal finale that keeps you on the edge of your seat, then rewards you with a satisfying yet ambiguous ending. Like I said, a damn near perfect season. After I finished season one, and mind you, I binge watched the entire series within a couple days, my immediate thoughts were, how can you even follow that up with a season two? There's absolutely no way you can continue with that concept. And I was pleasantly surprised with the direction they went in. You know, we often used to talk about um, how the real point of the show is to sort of get to this uh, littlest doll inside a matryoshka that is 
uh, the Russian doll. And so it's sort of a season one is like an invitation in. It's a things that I think we're all kind of struggling with around uh, self-destruction and stuff like that. You know, the truth. And, and yet, yeah. you know, we have to face the repercussions of that. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like it's 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 not spoken about, but it's still existing. It's this bubbling cauldron underneath everything. Alan's trying to block it out. Nadia's trying to run from it every second, but it is always there. It's unavoidable. You will end up dead in the next day because you haven't answered those questions. You know. Leon has said that if the first season was about how not to die, the second is about how to live. We pick up with Nadia about three years later, in the emergency room where it's clear Ruth is not in the best of health. Death is still a looming theme, but in a different way this time around. The universe isn't killing her, but allowing her to interact with family members who have already passed. The universe finally found something worse than death, being my mother. What? Cool. So, just happening to me then. Hey. This season takes Nadia and Alan through a time travel plot. Not a super original concept, but they still bring a refreshing perspective to this idea. In season one, the characters have no choice but to go through their death loop repeatedly. But in season two, the time travel is mostly voluntary. Something I really enjoy about this season is that even though it's time travel heavy, they never fall into the cliches of the butterfly effect. Their actions are breaking the constructs of time and causing the dimension to fall apart, but by removing the idea that every tiny action in the past dramatically changes the future, it allows us to just enjoy the ride and come up with our own ideas. Originally, Nadia finds herself accidentally on a time-traveling subway car as she's sent back to 1982 New York. Though she doesn't go back in time as herself, but as her mother Nora, played by Chloe Savini, as revealed later through the show's use of of mirrors. And not only is she walking around as her mom, but she's walking around as her mom pregnant with herself. So that completely raised the stakes of what Nadia is doing. After returning to the present and telling Alan about her time travel, his curiosity sends him back to 1962 East Berlin as his grandmother Agnes, played by Carolyn Michelle Smith. And I just have to say, while watching this, I was absolutely thinking about how I would feel about the ability to do something like this. Like, imagine not only being able to go back a few decades to interact with your ancestors, but to actually live live as them as well. We'd see Alan and Nadia toy with this temptation throughout the season, time traveling repeatedly with different agendas in mind. Nadia's main motivation this season is to prevent her mother from stealing and blowing her family's inheritance. A common thread throughout both seasons is that Nadia's family are Holocaust survivors. It's mentioned in season one, but really becomes the focal point of the story in season two. After the Holocaust, Nadia's grandmother Vera took all of her savings and exchanged it for gold Krugerrands, over $150,000 worth. At the time, Krugerrands were the only readily available one ounce gold coin, making them preferable for the collector that wasn't wealthy enough to buy gold bullion in bars or other larger forms. The United States banned the import of Krugerrands in 1985, as worldwide awareness of South African apartheid policies grew, though the coins remained legal to own as long as you weren't bringing them into the country, and the import ban has since been lifted. To my understanding, the practice of keeping your money in gold was popular amongst people who survived the genocide, given that all of their money and belongings were stolen from them at some point or another. Gold tends to hold its value, so it was the ideal choice for many families that experienced the theft of generational wealth. After going through a series of obstacles to get the coins back, Nadia attempts to bring them with her on the train into 2022, though she's unsuccessful when she gets distracted and her bag of gold just vanishes in thin air. Yes, I think I'm going.
Did somebody take my bag? Did you see who took my bag? So badly, I can't think of anything. Did you take my bag? It's implied here that the bag was not stolen, but just simply disappeared. Nadia goes even further back in time to secure her family's original heirlooms from 1944, and she brings them back into 1982, hoping to improve her family's lives and fix the mistakes of her mother. When she goes to exchange them for cash, her grandmother's best friend, Delia, laments that they'll be taking Krugerrands instead, which frustrates Nadia as she feels this choice is destined to lead her mother right into the same predicament. As season two comes to a climax, we get a resolution to Chekhov's pregnancy, can't just show a pregnancy and not have a payoff, when Nadia literally gives birth to herself. I mean, we literally couldn't get any more existential or meta here. Unfortunately, because Nadia finds herself completely engrossed with the past, she's unable to pay attention to the present, inadvertently ignoring Ruth's major health issues. Maxine and Lizzie are looking for Ruth while Nadia is MIA on her excursions when doctors discover that Ruth has a pulmonary embolism. At this point, Nadia has brought her baby self back with her into 2022 too and basically broke time. Go eat those little hairs up. Oh shit. Oh shit. Hello, Nemo? Yo, Maxine, can you hear me? Oh my god, it's her. Jesus, why haven't you been picking up your phone? What? I'm I'm on the train. Can you can you hear me? Listen, Ruth has a pulmonary embolism, she's in the hospital, okay? Wait, what? Pulmonary embolism. Is that what it is? It's a blood clot. Yeah, a blood clot in her lung. Nadia, listen, listen. They don't know she's gonna make it. <sighs> she is. Where's Ruth? Nadia, it doesn't look so good. What's the over under on Nadia showing up at all? I know, it's 2022. No one turns their phones off anymore. I know, you have to charge it. Hey, Max? Lizzie? Oh, good, Nadia, you're here. You owe me a light box. Hey. Uh, what the hell is happening? Someone trusted you with a baby. Okay, Dude. well, Ruth's fine. She's just changing. Ruth's fine? Yeah, it's just a fender bender. Just don't rush an old lady. Okay. Okay, Lizzie. <sighs> Hi, uh, I'm looking for a patient, uh, Ruth Brenner. She came back in probably today in an ambulance, maybe something wrong with her lungs. Brenner, you said? Yeah. Exam base seven. 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 Time off. Nadia, I thought you'd gone. Now listen, they want to keep me overnight. You know, they always want to run more tests. Nothing too thrilling. She creates a schism in time that allows Ruths from various dimensions to appear. She can't even be sure which Ruth she's speaking to as she searches for her in some of her last moments. Throughout the season, it's not entirely clear whether Nadia is using time travel as a way of avoidance or whether she truly believes that going to the past will help herself and Ruth in the present. But just by not being in the present, she misses Ruth's last moments. In the finale, we learn that Ruth has been dead for about a week, with Nadia not even knowing or realizing that much time had passed. I do think we're still left with a very satisfying conclusion for Nadia and Ruth's story that speaks to how death can often happen suddenly or without our knowledge and that we don't always have a chance to say goodbye. Time doesn't allow us to bring people back and those people can only live on with us through our past memories. Now you may notice I barely mentioned Alan in my summary of season two and that's because his story is not really Really there. There are signs of something there and there was so much potential, do not get me wrong, but ultimately his plot leaves a lot to be desired. So, what's your end game? Where's your long lost family fortune? Maybe it's not about fixing anything. You know, like you said, it, we leveled up. Maybe we're just supposed to like, I don't know, enjoy the ride. 
Now, this isn't to take away from everything Charlie Barnett brings to his role in season two. As he sees it, this season does follow an emotional and vulnerable story for his character, which often felt a bit autobiographical for him this go around. In an interview with Candace Frederick for the Huffington Post, he lets us into the mind of his character this season. There's a lot of conversation about last season being about death, he said. This season is about how do you live and I think Alan is like I want to figure out what I want from my life but with that new existential perspective must also come the realization that things might not work out exactly the way Alan or Agnes might think which can be difficult for the former character's self-controlling nature almost like when you're baking a cake and you're like oh I'm baking it this is gonna be good Barnett explained and you look over and realize you put salt in it. I got to pick this fucking cake and put it in. Do I make a savory cake now? What the fuck are we doing? We learned that Alan has been enjoying going back to 1962 Berlin as his grandmother, particularly to interact with a man that she was dating. His lighthearted, romantic fun quickly turned stress-inducing as he realizes his grandmother helped craft plans for an escape tunnel under the Berlin Wall. Alan says he doesn't want to change his past, and Barnett confirms this in his profile. For someone like Barnett and ultimately Alan in season two, changing aspects of his past isn't appealing because then he'd be redefining who he is today. No doubt that result could be better, he said. It could be worse. It's just a risk I'm unwilling to take. I think we all through life as you get older and of course depending on you and your own experience, you realize that the bad is just as useful as the good. He looks at his own history as a biracial black queer man who was adopted by white parents when he was four years old. Some people would say, oh my god, well adoption, you got left, he said. I of course have abandonment issues that I've been dealing with. I've been lucky enough to meet a lot of my birth family now, which has been incredibly incredible and challenging in its own right. This empathy compelled him, for instance, to think about the impact of being a biracial black man portraying an immigrant black woman in a different era and country and with many of the scenes being of him living as Agnes and not her in her own body. I don't want to be taking over a black woman's storyline literally, he recalled thinking. I was like, this is fucked, that shouldn't be. Thankfully, Natasha was willing to hear that and incorporate a lot more of Carolyn to see her in the situation in these moments, more than just my own reality. Despite Alan's desires to not want to change things while time traveling, we see him go against his grandmother's actions and contradict himself as he tries to convince his 1962 lover, Lenny, against escaping, encouraging him that the Berlin Wall will be knocked down in a couple decades. I know for a fact that that wall is going to come down. Don't go. You'll be reunited with your family if you just wait. Oh, wait? Mm hmm Until when? Uh, I until 1989. <laughs> <laughs> what game are you playing? asking me to wait 27 years to see my family. Lenny escapes and for the rest of the season, Alan is left wondering if he was supposed to stop him, feeling guilty that something could have went wrong. In the last episode, Alan gets to see his grandmother face to face somewhere underground in what we can only assume is an existential void that we're not really meant to understand. Alan, look at you. What happened to Lenny? Lenny, I, I don't know. You don't know? So was I supposed to stop him from going then? Or, or I shouldn't have done anything. I, I, I shouldn't have done anything at all. Why did I do anything? I fuck it all up. I always fuck it up. Alan, Alan, I don't know. And that's all right. I just want answers. I just, I just want to know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being this way. You are just like me. We can't spend our lives so scared of making the wrong move that, that we never live at all. 
Don't be so afraid to live. Though I did find this moment emotional for what it represents, getting to connect so directly to an ancestor, the scene felt a bit out of place. There are only seven episodes in season two rather than eight, and I can't help but wonder why they didn't take the opportunity to add another episode to the lineup that explored Alan's story in particular. I'm sure the episode cut had much more to do with budgetary restrictions than anything, but to see the show focus so much on the effects of intergenerational trauma this season, it is interesting to me that those themes are barely explored with his character, especially given the background information on his grandmother that we do get. This is a show made by all women who really value the story they're telling, and it shows in the writing. In television, women are still underrepresented as directors and showrunners, especially in the sci-fi genre. In an article for Deadline, David Robb writes, despite a precipitous 36% decline in the number of scripted television episodes produced during the worst days of the COVID pandemic, the percentage of women and people of color who directed them reached record highs in the 2020 and 2021 season. According to the latest DGA inclusion report, 38% of episodes in the 2020 to 2021 season were directed by women, which was up 8% from 35% the season before, and more than double the 16% they directed in 2014. People of color directed 34% of the episodes, which was up 17.2% from 29% in the prior season, and more than double their 16% from 2014. That being said, this is a show made by mostly white women. As far as I can tell, there have only been two black women in that writer's room. Shout out to Jocelyn Bio, who makes a cameo, by the way, and Zakia Alexander, because their influence is absolutely felt. But there are no other women of color at all, from what I understand. And I don't like that. While opportunities as directors and showrunners may be increasing for women in the field, they're not increasing for every racial and ethnic group at the same rate, of course. When we specify and account for both gender and race, those numbers look a lot different. Broken down by gender, Caucasian men directed 39% of the episodes and Caucasian women directed 23%. African American males directed 11% of the episodes and African American American females directed 7%, Latino males directed 5%, and Latinas directed 4%, Asian American men directed 5%, and Asian American women directed 2%, Native American men directed 0.3%, and Native American women directed 0.1%. Now, do I think the show benefits from having so many women involved in the making and production of the show? Of course, but just because I thoroughly enjoy Russian Doll doesn't mean I'm going to gloss over the obvious. I think anytime your writer's room is almost completely white and looks like this, it causes the show to suffer from some blind spots. Here, I think it happens mostly with Alan's storyline in season two. The inclusion of his character felt handled with so much care and concern in the first eight episodes of the series. But by episode 15, you're literally asking yourself what his storyline even is. And it seems that's the case because of unsure and potentially lazy decisions made by the majority of the writer's room. When black characters are included in a production, their narratives deserve to be treated with just as much intrigue and delicacy as their counterparts. That doesn't feel as though it was accomplished, with Alan's character arc feeling empty and rushed this season. I recently asked y'all in a community post how you felt about season one versus season two, and I know I'm not alone in this because y'all felt the same way. The Alien Review says, They were both good, both capture different lives and different storylines. I wish to see more of Alan's life in the time machine. N. Pitzer states, Really liked season two in a completely different way from season one, but Alan was missing big time. And KM agrees, Not enough Alan in season two, and he had such a lazy storyline. But that aside, I don't have many gripes with the show, and overall, I think production, for the most part, did a standout job both seasons. 
I think there was this beautiful succinctness to season one, too, that it felt so still untied. There was a lot of things unanswered, but it left everyone leaving with a fill in the blank, which is what's beautiful about the story itself. I know for myself, I was afraid of like, well, where where would Alan go? Why would anyone want to know anything more? So I wasn't sure that the character even would return. I'm, and maybe this is just also the nature of me. I was a little terrified because there is a certain sense of having to live up to what you just put out. And it was so, it was so well done in all of its risk taking and, and successful in its entertainment value. So it, it, it achieved so much in the first one. I was, I was scared about, can I even live up to what Natasha is going to imagine for the next step? <laughs> This show is so intriguing because it excels at utilizing themes we've seen before while avoiding being completely predictable. Death loops and time travel are nothing new, but Russian Doll does something new with those concepts, touching on interesting nuances. The way they handle the following themes elevates the series from just good to pretty incredible. You know, the basic conceit of the season is is that they have figured out how to stop dying. They found this human connection that sort of gives them the, the will to live. But sort of three and a half years later, what does it mean to truly be alive? The present moment is almost too much to bear and to look at in the light of day. And so they find this way out, you know, like this wormhole to a past where suddenly at first, you know what I mean? Just like drugs. Oh my gosh, it's so fun that first hit. And over time, it's kind of like they're taken in deeper, which is this stuff that they have to look at in order to kind of really exist in the present. They're going to have to do it. You know what I mean? Like there is no way out in this life. You gotta, you guys just gotta fucking do it. Despite never really being named out loud in the show, addiction is a recurring theme throughout the series. One could even argue that the show's premise in itself is a metaphor for addiction, with death and rebirth being stand-ins for relapse and recovery. Our main characters both indulge in substance use frequently. For Nadia, it's chain-smoking cigarettes and doing a plethora of narcotics. For Alan, it's binge drinking. Natasha Leone talked about bringing the reality of navigating addiction or addictive behaviors into the fabric of the show. So, you know, when we say um, sort of a life and death, it's a bit of this idea of like, you know, uh, you know, in many ways, kind of like the drugs are just sort of like the final step on a person who's already, you know, decided, uh, uh, hey, who cares either way what happens? You know what I mean? Like some of those decisions that get made. And so sort of like what are the twists and turns that get you there and that get you out of there without, um, you know, only because it was sort of a direct example from my life that was sort of convenient to, to draw on. One of the best visual and musical moments of the series is this one long take of Nadia almost giving up when she realizes her fate is inevitable, so she binges as many drugs as she can. Honestly, every time I see this shot, I'm just completely in awe and I'm wondering how they were able to accomplish it. My thought is that they attached some sort of rig to her so she was able to kind of do this in one long take. The music in this scene is haunting, particularly the lyrics. People often seek the thrills of addiction for its ability to allow us to detach from life. The lyrics, I go to sleep, couldn't be a better representation of this feeling. At its core, this show is exploring the lives of two people who have completely detached themselves from the will to live. Nadia's initial death is accidental, while Alan makes the decision to take his life. 
both of these scenarios could be understood to represent various outcomes for those struggling with addiction, with death frequently looming in the background. I think addiction is a very complex topic that requires a lot of compassion and delicacy. The ways we have historically demonized addiction has led to many misconceptions about the reality of drugs and how someone becomes addicted to them. In a world that's incredibly difficult for anyone to live in, especially those who are marginalized in various ways, drugs often provide physical and mental relief for people all over the globe. And I say this as someone who has a bit of a flower dependency herself on account of my anxiety. The majority of the population is reliant on a drug of some sort, from coffee to cigarettes to alcohol to weed to Tylenol. The criminalization and racialization of particular drugs has led to almost all recreational drug use being viewed as dangerous and shameful, and to be clear, addiction is neither one of those things. So all in all, I appreciate the fact that we get honest, nonchalant depictions of drug use throughout the series. Not to suggest addiction is no big deal, but that drug use can be no big deal or that things can be a bit more complex than we're used to accepting. Their ability to pull this off speaks to the brilliant subtlety of the show. While addiction is never painted in a negative light, it's still very much portrayed as a struggle, with Nadia and Alan both having to do some true soul searching through the inevitable death loop in order to change some of their addictive habits. But I think to answer your question, there were a lot of signifiers in you know, the pilot and then the subsequent series that I don't think even we realized how powerful they were. Yeah. Like I think because we were hit, we were shooting from the hip yeah. um, in such a very intense, like spiritual, mind meldy, existential way. Yeah. Like there were a lot of things that like the mirror, for example, was just something that sort of suddenly happened. And it was yeah. like, well, of course she's, She's in the bathroom and the door yeah, was like a thing that was- for some reason it was always in the bathroom and she was kind of like in the bathroom kind of fixing her chains, which was really just a kind of, yeah. what is this private moment when you find some, but I don't think that the, but it was the only, layering effect meant anything. It was only when we were on set that I realized how yeah. strong it was. Like when I was actually staring at you through the lens yeah. and you were looking back there, that I was like, yeah. oh right, cause it's a mirror, I get it. You know, like, <laughs> like you know what I mean? Like, Reflection can be both literal and metaphorical, serving multiple meanings. Whether we're looking into a physical mirror or into the deep recesses of our psyches, ultimately the act of reflecting is to look directly at ourselves. Mirrors are used symbolically throughout the series to represent the internal reflection that's required of our main characters. There are some brilliant uses of the camera and editing tricks that really lean into this motif, giving us mirroring shots between Nadia and Alan, always reminding us of how integral reflection is to the narrative. Russian Doll uses the idea of reflection to lay out a few questions on the table. How do we mirror other people? What truths can a mirror hold? What do we see when looking at our own reflection? In season one, both Nadia and Alan respond in bathrooms directly in front of a mirror Every time they die and come back to life, they're forced to really look at themselves, forced to dig deeper into that reflection every single time. Halfway through season one, Ruth reveals the significance of mirrors in the Volvokov household. Oh, the mirrors. Don't get me started on the mirrors. One day, she shattered them, and when I came to take Nadia to school, well, the mirrors were gone, and there was glass everywhere. I think there were even some shards in your hair. And that's a wrap. It wasn't that bad. It was that bad. I was there. So was I. This is an interesting tidbit, considering it creates a parallel between Alan and Nora. Alan is the first character we actually see smash a mirror on screen, 
and it's when he's confronting the gingerbread man. Charlie Barnett's delivery is done so well, and initially I wouldn't have thought much of him smashing that mirror, but on repeated viewing, it feels quite significant that he does this. Alan is struggling to look at himself honestly throughout the series, which is why he often invests himself in compulsive behaviors with the idea that they will one day lead him into a perfect life, in the discovery that his girlfriend of nine years has been sleeping with a sleazy, very flawed, and unattractive professor. He can't fathom why his girlfriend would be interested in Mike and not himself. But the reality is, Alan is barely interested in himself because he refuses to be honest with himself. He looks in the mirror every day and pretends that he's doing just great, even though he's obviously not. So when he lashes out here, yeah, you're uh, you're Alan. Yeah, you know this man. It's uh, we're fine. No, you can go. No, no, no. You don't know me. You don't Listen, know me. Listen, Alan. We can talk about this. <laughs> hey, that's enough. Okay, right, that's okay, enough. I'm going. Alan, she's unhappy, man. I'm just her excuse to leave. Go to hell. I think it's representative of how tired he is of seeing his physical reflection because he's not ready to truly reflect. He's not ready to admit that maybe he is flawed, maybe his relationship is not perfect, and not just for Beatrice, but also for himself. As Ruth explains later, Nora had very similar motivations behind her disdain for mirrors. Why, why mirrors? Reflection. Proof of existence, another pair of eyes. See, that's why therapists are important. Without them, we are very unreliable narrators of our own stories. I just find this comment from Ruth so profound, it's one of my favorite moments in the series by far, especially her note on mirrors providing proof of existence and not being able to lie to us the ways that we can. It made me think very hard about proof of existence and really how we do run from our reflections when we don't want to see certain things about ourselves. This parallel between Alan and Nora continues throughout the rest of season one, but we'll explore that a bit later when I talk about mental health. Towards the end of season one, on one of Nadia and Alan's last respawns, the mirrors disappear. Hey, there are no mirrors, no, Alan. Mirrors, I know, I know, me too. What is happening, man? Why are they disappearing? I don't know. I don't know. I interpreted this as the point in the series when they had seen all they needed to see. Reflection is necessary for our growth and well-being, but there comes a point in time where reflecting on the same scenarios over and over again serves only as a mechanism to keep ourselves from moving forward keeping us in the past or in some sort of purgatory. I think this is most evident in the representation of Nadia hallucinating herself as a child. And I think this also serves as the reflection motif as she's confronting her inner child. It's another form of mirroring. Nadia believes that her younger self is stuck, insinuating that she as an adult is stuck as well. I don't know how or why but uh, my past self, the little girl that I used to be, literally keeps showing up. Is she here right now? No, uh, but every time I see her, we die. I, I think that maybe she's lost. Trapped somewhere between the past and present. The last time Nadia hallucinates her younger self is at the restaurant where she attempts to give her ex-boyfriend's daughter one of her favorite childhood books. All of a sudden, his daughter morphs into mini Nadia and adult Nadia starts bleeding out. 
What's most intriguing in this scene is she's literally pulling broken mirror shards from her throat from the day her mother broke all of the mirrors. This is the root of a lot of Nadia's guilt surrounding her mother's passing, considering not too long after her mother broke all of these mirrors, Nadia was permanently put in Ruth's care. She's literally being forced to purge this burden that has kept her in a state of purgatory really her entire life. I found found Nadia's final death particularly chilling, which was apparently the goal of the writers and creators. I was just going to say that I, the reason I'm so proud and of the of the la, of what I guess you could call the last death of pulling yeah. the glass out was that I'm so proud of it because we made death scary again. Like I was yeah. like we made it scary, then we made it funny, and then we made it scary again. Yeah. And it's all in in total like deference to your performance in that scene. In season two, the use of mirrors is much more literal. For example, they're used as a device to show us when one of the characters is time traveling in their parent or grandparent's body. Even though they are used more literally, they still carry a symbolic meaning. Looking into your reflection and seeing a parent or an ancestor is quite honestly what we're always doing when we look in the mirror. Even when we want to believe we don't look that much like our parents or their parents, we ultimately are a reflection of them in totality. Very trippy stuff, but the creators are very trippy abstract thinkers. How did you, you, know? how, how did you get to multiverse? Because it's the only only time I've ever discussed multiverse was with Elon Musk on stage here. Oh, um, I, and he I would say that he probably is getting there um, with far more concrete uh, information and education to back it up would be my first guess. Uh, so I think to me, frankly, just, you know, I, I know it's a room full of people who probably actually know what a lot of these things mean, but the thing about Hollywood is uh, that uh, I think that I'm somebody who always had a deep curiosity about these kinds of things. You know, I was a film and philosophy double major and, and um, at Tisch. I think I always was just a very curious sort of, you know, uh, quantum character. I yeah. think I never had a really... Um, uh, you know, I always had a suspicion that there was something curious happening sort of uh, between what we define as sort of like the ether and the things tethering us, you know? Mm -hmm. um, reality. Uh, between reality. I mean, Natasha's mind is a multiverse. Uh, okay, all right. It, 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 I mean, if you... Thanks, Cindy. Well, no, it's true, in the best way. Like, if you're around her for any length of time. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit, I think, I think funny. Um, it's brain damage. Uh, and... <laughs> Uh, so anyway, the use of reflection serves so many layered purposes in Russian Doll. And if I talked about them all, I'd be here all day. But just know, when you see a mirrored image in the show, the directors are trying to get something across that you may miss on the surface. Well, I've known Brendan for a long time, and I've I've always loved him and been friends with him, and I've worked with him here and there, and. Uh, you know, I'm not saying that Horse is or isn't based on a real gutter punk from Tompkins Square Park, but um, that I hung out with. But, you know, eh, cut to the end of the story. Brendan is excellent in the show. <laughs> excellent. Before we get into some deeper themes, I want to take some time to talk about the significance of Horse, played by Brendan Sexton III. He's a side character who we haven't really talked about much up until this point, but there are implications that he has some sort of connection to Nadia, and possibly some abilities to manipulate the Russian doll's broader universe. The first time we're introduced to Horse is outside of Nadia's birthday party, where he leans up against the fence across the street. She says, I think I know that guy. Foreshadowing their future relationship. We don't learn much information about Horse other than the fact that he's unhoused. He does make some comments claiming that him and a business partner created the dark web, though we're not really sure whether that is true. I prefer casual acquaintances over closer relations and strangers above everybody else because humanity is a fuck man. I had this business partner once in the 90s when we were creating the dark web and he got arrested because it was a scam and the government is a scam and once I saw oh, it's all just bullshit, I just dropped out completely. There are a lot of theories about what Horse's character is meant to symbolize, and it seems that ambiguity was the intention of the writers, though Hedlund does confirm in an interview with Polygon that his character is meant to take a mythical religious shape. 
He's neither creation nor destruction. Russian doll co-creator Leslie Headland told Polygon, explaining her personal take on the character. To me, Horse is the god of Pan. He lives in the woods in Tompkins Square Park, and he is all of our unconscious or subconscious selves. Pan, the Greek god of the wild, of shepherds, of chaos, makes sense as a point of comparison given Horse's inherently chaotic chaotic nature. I have mixed feelings about the depiction of his character. On one hand, seeing Nadia get so up close and personal with an unhoused person was a refreshing visual that the media rarely shows us of people who are unhoused, indicative of broader societal treatment towards unhoused people. Nadia sips liquor out of the same bottle with him and huffs paint out of the same paper bag with him. She often exchanges physically intimate moments with him, giving him hugs, wrapping her arm around him, him, kissing him on the forehead. She allows him to give her a haircut and even cuddles up with him on the street one night, leading to another death for her and also for him. It's fucking cold. Fucking Christ, that's dark. This is the death that sparks Nadia to evolve and take seriously her ability to influence life's outcomes if she wants to, all for the sake of an acquaintance. This goes directly against Nadia's innate desire to have no connection, commitment, or responsibility to another person. After Horace's death, there's a shift, and she goes out of her way to save his life. Knowing that the reason Horace is sleeping outside is because someone in the shelter stole his shoes, Nadia goes to the shelter where he's staying on the night of her birthday. Who are you? I'm just a person that is here guarding your shoes. Well, I don't know what kind of weird scene you're involved in, but... If you're gonna sit there, don't touch me while I'm sleeping because I've got serious reflexes. It's clear that Nadia has a genuine care and concern for Horse and their interactions are endearing to watch. But I couldn't help but shake the religious or fairy tale themes his character is intended to represent with him acting as a sort of shepherd of the universe. It's as if his interactions with Nadia have the purpose of setting her life back on track. He acts as a voice of spiritual wisdom and guidance, as we heard confirmed by Leslie Headland, who was one of the creators. This is where my feelings towards the writing of his character get complicated, because I think this plays into this trope that has long existed in our literature and media of the mystery mystical, magical, homeless person, which rubs me the wrong way for its dehumanizing nature. TVTropes.org describes this trope as wisdom from the gutter, though I do think that term in itself is pretty offensive. You don't expect your average homeless person to want to talk, much less have a lesson they're prepared to teach you that somehow specifically addresses your problem. Sometimes this is combined with the idea that angels disguise themselves as beggars and homeless people. It even goes back to fairy tales that have fairies disguising themselves as old beggar women, making this trope one of the oldest ones in the book. They also specify that this trope is frequently represented by a poor, oppressed, uneducated and or mentally challenged individual. Horse is someone who exhibits all of these traits and is frequently meant to give cryptic advice. How do you know that you're real? Huh? Do you think that we need people to be like witnesses? In here. That's where you know. The more stuff you accumulate, the more space you take up. You know, people can't even pick me out of a ladder because they don't remember me. I'm a shadow, man. I think I'm a shadow now, too.
This is even reaffirmed further in season two with the writers giving Horse some sort of control over Nadia and Alan's ability to time travel. He leads them directly to the time traveling train, which eventually leads them both into the void. Which, by the way, were absolutely stunning to see. These scenes were shot practically in the underground cisterns of Budapest and oh my god i had to like look up what a cistern was after seeing these i'm like what the hell this is beautiful so i would watch season two just based off the visuals alone in the finale as much as the show attempts to humanize horse and i do think they are successful at that in a few regards they still inadvertently play into an offensive trope unhoused people of course have the ability to provide words of wisdom but just as any other individual does the implication that their unhoused nature is because they are a wandering angel of sorts completely ignores the realities of people living in poverty and the systemic oppression that causes someone to be unhoused. It minimizes and dismisses the systemic issues that have led to their circumstances in the first place. Unhoused people are not strictly vessels of inspiration or existential wisdom for the general public. Again, I have mixed feelings about the depiction of his character, but overall I love Horace and I wish that we got to see more of his narrative. These narratives that we that we kind of, you know, tell ourselves, these stories that we've been hearing over and over and as to who we are and why we are the way we are and just also like the acceptance of that, you know, and, and making peace with that. Two themes that feel the most prominent throughout both seasons are intergenerational trauma and post-memory. Because these two theories frequently overlap, I'll be discussing them both in this section. Intergenerational trauma was first written about by Vivian M. Rakoff to describe the high rates of psychological distress experienced by children of Holocaust survivors. Intergenerational trauma, sometimes referred to as trans or multi-generational trauma, is defined as trauma that gets passed down from those who directly experience an incident to subsequent generations. Intergenerational trauma may begin with a traumatic event affecting an individual, traumatic events affecting multiple family members, or collective trauma affecting larger community, cultural, racial, ethnic, or other groups, populations, historical trauma. Post-memory is a similar theory. The theory is described by Marianne Hirsch as the relationship of children to survivors of cultural or collective trauma to the experiences of their parents, experiences that they remember only as the stories and images with which they grew up, but that are so powerful, so monumental as to constitute memories in their own right. In season one, these themes hang in the backdrop, often symbolized through her connection to her only gold Krugerrand that she wears as a necklace. When she initially tells Alan about her mother selling all the gold that was meant to be her inheritance, leaving her with just one coin, she plays the situation off as if it's not a big deal. So my grandparents acquired 150 of these babies and then my mother, because she's a fucking piece of work, she spent them all except for this one. How much is 150? You know, the price of gold fluctuates, but uh, I had to guess $152,780.86. Oh. Yeah. I know this because why? Because it was my fucking college fund. But hey, I got a pretty necklace, right? So. Your mom, she, she sounds. Great. Uh, so, what happened after this? Later on, her dismissive attitude is contradicted when she passes off her necklace to her acquaintance horse. Is that real gold? Why? It's too heavy. 
Here, she tells Horse that the necklace is too heavy. What that means is really up to the audience's interpretation. Personally, I took this statement as her venting about the guilt she carries along with that necklace, along with that trauma of understanding where they come from. We get a visual representation and call back to this admission from Nadia in season two, when she breaks time and ends up between life and death in the finale aptly titled The Void. Here, she finds the gold coins that magically disappeared on the train earlier in the season. As she tugs on the bag, it's clear that it's too heavy. She's forced to let go of this goal to repair her family's trauma, which leaves room for her to make space for it. Nadia's experience with intergenerational trauma is on full display in season two, as she jumps back and forth in time with the intention of saving her family's inheritance. A great example of how post-memory works is in season two, when Nadia comes face to face with her grandmother for the first time while time traveling. As she's being lectured for just stealing the family's fortune, she cuts her grandmother off before she can finish. You do nothing but take and take. Those coins were the only security we had for, for when Hitler, Hitler comes back. back. I know, I know. Regimes change, currencies become obsolete, only gold remains. Yeah. Well, if all the curves exist in the sweet spot where paranoia meets hyperinflation. In this scene, we get a glimpse into how traumatic memories are recounted and passed down. Nadia has never been given one of her grandmother's lectures until now, yet she's heard it all before from her own mother. This is even more intriguing given that Nora and Vera very clearly don't get along, with Nora most likely aiming to be the absolute opposite of her mother. And still, she unconsciously relays her mother's grievances to her own daughter, as if they were her own with just as much conviction. When her attempts to save her family's gold coins and bring them into the present fail, Nadia does some research and learns about the gold train that all of her family's belongings were shipped off on during the war. This train that Russian doll references was sadly very much real. Was there a Hungarian gold train? Yes, not only did it exist, but the United States military intercepted it in 1945 and had full receipts for the items inside. However, instead of attempting to return the stolen goods to the Hungarian people, the United States just sort of took all of that insane wealth for itself. There were promises to restore to refugees who were displaced by or survived the Holocaust, but instead, US military personnel serving in Austria, like Major General Harry Mary J. Collins inherited the riches for their own homes. Post-World War II, the warehouse where the items were stored was open to the public for sale. Similar to the sale of stolen goods and the giant warehouse that Nadia discovers in Budapest. This is one part of Russian Doll that is sadly very true and calls for reparations and returning items to the descendants of their original owners have still only been met with half measures. Nadia finds her family's receipt of ownership and goes back to 1944 Budapest to steal her family's heirlooms back from the Nazis. Only this time, she's inhabiting her grandmother's body. Numbers, numbers. 1407. 
Nadia goes back in time to pretty much willingly face the roots of her family's trauma head on, something she was undoubtedly affected by in season one, but did not want to confront. Her withdrawn and avoidant disposition is a common symptom exhibited by those who have inherited familial trauma. Notably, Galati and Belle have found lower levels of differentiation of self and poorer communication compared to their control groups. This is consistent with other research that has identified distinctive patterns of personality characteristics and milder psychological vulnerabilities. These vulnerabilities included subclinical chronic depressive and anxiety reactions, guilt, unresolved mourning, agitation, insomnia, and nightmares. Felsen 1998 also found tendencies towards mistrustfulness, difficulty expressing emotions, difficulty regulating aggression, chronic guilt, and self-criticism. Inherited trauma is not just emotional, it's physical, it's material. Through colonization, generations all over the globe have been completely stripped of their resources, belongings, and family members. That kind of trauma impacts your entire lineage. Nadia wants to believe that she can go back in time and fix all of her family's problems, and don't we all? But the series explores a more honest reality that things most likely would still end up the way they were. Nora's con man boyfriend who convinces her to steal her family's inheritance to begin with ends up giving us a word of wisdom that permeates throughout the show. If I was you, I would drop the whole thing. Really? Uh, look man, I didn't really come here to have the thief give me advice on getting back my family inheritance. No, what I mean is, it's a Coney Island. What do you mean, the last stop on the D train? In our house, a Coney Island is the thing that would have made everything better if only it had happened or didn't happen. My father couldn't work. He got sick with polio and wound up in an iron lung. Now, if only he hadn't gone to Coney Island that summer, he wouldn't have gotten the airborne polio, but he did. It's a fantasy. It's an if only. The idea that if we could turn back time and make one thing different, that our entire lives would be different is very idealistic and quite impossible. No matter what Nadia did, she could not save her family from external forces and the violent, deadly reality of the Holocaust. She could not force her mother to live her life differently or make different decisions. It's my theory that this is why when Nadia is able to save the gold coins, they still end up disappearing on the train and she's never able to bring them into the present. And even when she is able to recoup her family's original property, she still ends up with gold coins in the end that she knows will ultimately be mishandled by her mother. Bars, coins, cash? Oh, yeah. Kruger ends. I don't want. Krugerrands. Vera, we discussed this. It's the most stable currency. Remember the penger. Krugerrands. I didn't do all this just to end up with the same fucking Krugerrands. Kruger Implying that no matter the path, Nadia will end up with the same outcome. Both theories, post-memory and intergenerational trauma, were first presented through the lens of Holocaust survivors and their children, though they are not phenomenons exclusive to that demographic. 
Black and Indigenous folks living throughout the Americas and the Caribbean and really anywhere else in the world could tell you that with absolute certainty we're all experiencing some level of intergenerational trauma. I'd love to analyze how intergenerational trauma informs Alan's storyline but I can't really do that because these themes aren't explored with his character which I'll admit feels like a bit of a missed opportunity. Alan's family history is rarely mentioned and even though we do get some information about his grandmother through the time jumps, it's not sufficient enough to flesh out Alan's ancestry. The most we learn is that she was a Ghanaian graduate student studying abroad in 1962 Berlin. They don't give us any details about her degree, but we can assume it's engineering related as she helps write plans to help her boo Lenny tunnel under the Berlin Wall. The writers maintain her connection to tunnels when she seen working on the MTA in the 1980s where she runs into Nadia as Nora. She's also present when Nadia gives birth to herself on the subway platform, alluding that Nadia and Alan's families have been deeply connected for some time, though we're never given a confirmation of where that connection began. And it also seems to be something both characters are currently unaware of, so if they go on with a season three, that could be a very interesting route to explore. I don't know how much of this is conscious with you, Natasha, but you do have a beautiful way of incorporating so much of our personal lives. You know, I was adopted and I had never met my birth mother and there was, I have met a lot of my birth family, but never really met, she passed away, I never met my birth mother and it always just felt like a whole, that relation to my grandmother and this character through Alan is the same, but we needed somebody who, like you and Chloe, had, the, had a relationship connection and Carolyn, Smith, who is, you know, we went to Juilliard together. We've known each other for many, many years now. She's a, such a nurturing, loving figure and in, in just in general, just who, who she is. I immediately thought of her and it, I think was the easiest. They presented us with such an interesting setup for Agnes and I personally would have loved to get more of a backstory on her and her family as Candace Frederick and Alan talk about in their interview. Barnett did a lot of research to understand the type of circumstances Agnes could be coming from, a backstory we sadly don't see much of in Russian Doll. Like he says, the fact that many people, mostly men from countries in Africa like Congo and Nigeria, were recruited by Germany to join their communist agenda. There is also the fact that Agnes would have had a myriad of sexist and racist interactions that could have been dangerous for her. And as Barnett noted, romances with white Germans like the one she has with Lenny would certainly have resulted in her arrest. Not to mention the men that you're already traveling with, he added as his eyes welled up. There are stories of that being a part of the complication. You're going for your education and to come out a higher and better person and I'm getting emotional thinking about it. The things we do learn about her are mostly in service to other characters, so when it comes to Alan's familial trauma, there's not much to dig into. If anyone feels like I'm missing any nuances or details to Alan or Agnes's story, please feel free to correct me in the comments, but it seems as if his storyline was intended to be more lighthearted to contrast maybe the heavy nature of what Nadia's going through, and it does sort of work. But Personally, it left me wanting more. I don't need to go to see a therapist. No offense to you, but I, people thinking that I'm crazy is one of my biggest fears. No, 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 no. We do not use the word crazy in this house. Russian Doll doesn't shy away from exploring the complexities of mental health, often affirming the characters who are struggling in that regard. Just a quick disclaimer, although I'll be discussing mental health in this section, I am not a mental health professional. I will not be attempting to diagnose any of these characters with any disorders in particular, especially if they are not named with a diagnosis in the show. When Nadia first dies and comes back to life, she initially thinks she's having a bad trip. But as she trips out, unaware of what's happening, her friend Maxine calls her crazy. Will you stop acting crazy? Oh my god, I am not crazy, okay? I am not crazy! You know I hate it when people call me crazy! 
Look, all right, I get it, all right? I realize I sounded a little fucking crazy, all right? I'm just defending myself here, okay? This is on her. Or maybe you're just crazy. What are you doing? Hey. It's the first time we hear this word and we see Nadia's reaction to it, alluding that it's a trigger. As she spirals, coming up with more theories for why she's stuck in this death loop, she starts thinking it could be religion or haunting related. After she fails to prove this theory, she concedes that she may be having a mental moment. She goes to Ruth, her mother figure, and tells her that she's been dying over and over again. Instead of questioning Nadia or telling her that it's impossible, Ruth listens to her and engages with her reality as if it's real. She hears Nadia out completely and then asks if this is a situation where Nadia needs psychiatric interference. We've had some scary times, have we not? Mm-hmm. And I always said to you, if things got really scary, you would say to me, Record player, Ruth. Record player. Are you sure? Should I call my guy at Bellevue? Is it the nicest psych ward? It's definitely the closest one. While we talk about Ruth Brenner, can I just say I absolutely love her character. When I tell you I sobbed at the end of season two when she passed, I mean I sobbed. Ashley brought so much warmth and honesty to the role and I'm also just a sucker for anybody with a smooth raspy voice who gives great existential advice. Listen to me, you were this tiny seed buried in darkness fighting your way to the light. You wanted to live. It's the most beautiful thing in the world. Do you still have that in you? Oh, Nadia, I look at you now chasing down death at every corner and sweetheart where is that gorgeous piece of you pushing to be a part of this world Natasha Leone mentioned that as much as the character Nadia is a bit autobiographical for her, the same could be said for Ruth. There is a real Ruth in my life, and she definitely said, Nothing in this world is easy except pissing in the shower. She also said, That's what you get for going to Jersey. I mean, it's free to get in, but you gotta pay to get out. <laughs> My Ruth is a chemist, this Ruth is a shrink, so they're quite different. But the essence of the idea of like in Manhattan, you can scramble through a whole hectic day of being a troublemaker and then just show up at some safe haven where there's chicken in the fridge, that's definitely a direct pull from my life. Ruth's relationship to Nadia is so heartwarming and keeps the show grounded. As the writers present us with so many existential questions, Ruth is often there to offer Nadia and the viewers a sense of comfort and relief. Nadia doesn't know what's going on in her head, but she often makes the connection that her mental health has something to do with her mother's. Uh, I think I might be losing it like I'm going crazy. No, 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 no. We do not use that word in this house. Never did, never will. What was her diagnosis? It's like, what the fuck was wrong with her? Do not confuse your mother with her damage. What Ruth says here leaves things open to the audience's interpretation, but I took this to represent the reality of many folks navigating mental illness. Psychological distress does not occur in a vacuum. Of course, we can have certain genetic predispositions, but more often than not, our environment impacts how those dispositions show up. 
Going back to the piece on intergenerational trauma, Nadia's mother, Nora, is the daughter of a Holocaust survivor. It's said that Nora is struggling with schizophrenia, and it seems that her own relationship with her mother was strained, which is common for families that have experienced such brutal oppression. She undoubtedly grew up carrying an immense amount of trauma that most likely negatively impacted her mental state. Sorcher and Cohen found that the children of Holocaust survivors had significantly more Holocaust ideation than other Jews of their generation. That is to say, the parents' trauma is an ongoing part of the children's day-to-day -day mental lives. This suggests the presence of an unmet need for the children of survivors to process or integrate the traumatic experiences with which their parents have transmitted to them. Yehuda et Ali found that the intergenerational transmission of trauma, specifically PTSD symptomology, was predicated upon the severity of the PTSD symptoms of the parent. They found a direct relationship between the PTSD symptomology of parent survivors and the degree of similar symptoms in their children. They also found suppressed cortisol levels both in Holocaust survivors that had been diagnosed with PTSD and their children. More more specifically, this finding was confirmed by Van Jadorn et Ali, identifying cortisol levels were suppressed specifically in survivors with disassociation. Suppressed cortisol levels in PTSD cases has been associated with a non-engagement style of coping with PTSD symptoms, emphasizing withdrawal and avoidance. Low cortisol levels have also been linked to depression, chronic pain, sleep disturbance, and fatigue. While Nadia is time traveling as Nora in season two, she's thrown into a psych ward, giving her a very real understanding of how her mother was treated due to her mental condition. There was little empathy afforded to anyone experiencing a mental health crisis in the 1980s and still now, with involuntary patients often being completely stripped of their own autonomy. I think her interactions as her mother in season two add a lot of perspective regarding Nadia's feelings towards her mother in the first season. Season 1, episode 7, The Way Out, is a standout episode for the way it approaches mental health and motherhood alone. We meet Nora for the first time, played by Chloe Savini, at the top of the episode, and we continue to get glimpses of her and Nadia's relationship throughout. She's parked her family-friendly convertible askew in front of the grocery store, blocking traffic, and leaving her daughter in the passenger seat to be screamed at by angry drivers. When she comes out, she's carrying nothing but watermelon. Later on, they end up at another grocery store and her entire back seat is completely full with watermelons. This room. Why would you say that? You didn't even try. I have a trunk, don't I? Can you see I have a trunk? Would your wife need a coat? They're going to Goodwill. I'm not spending another fucking winter in the city, huh? Are you okay? Why the fuck are you talking to my kid? Put the melons in the trunk. Go get the rest. This very kind grocery store clerk shows some valid concern for Nadia because this is a concerning picture. Nothing about this situation can be perceived as a safe environment for Nadia, and his genuine care is only met with hostility and a hint of racism from Nora, who feels attacked by his question to Nadia. She only makes the situation more traumatic by then guilting and manipulating Nadia to lie about the cashier's actions with the intent to have him reprimanded or fired. What's fucking wrong with people? I didn't do anything to him. I don't know why he yelled at me. I don't know, Mom. He was wrong. You were right. Thank you, Nadia. Don't ever let him tear us apart, okay? Never? Never. Go tell his boss what he did. What? Go tell his boss what he fucking did to me. This moment puts the harsh reality of being a child with a parent who is struggling with their mental health on display. Nadia understands that her mother is in the wrong, but she wants to calm her down and please her, so she tells her she's right. 
At first, I was confused about all the watermelon until rewatch when I heard Nadia make a quip about inheriting an eating disorder from her mother. Then it immediately clicked for me. Nora has herself and Nadia on a watermelon only diet. This is confirmed with Ruth's comments once they find themselves at her house, Nadia trying to do homework with her mother chopping erratically. Point. You want chicken noodle or cream of mushroom? You can't live on watermelon, sweetheart. I don't think so, Ruth. So help me, if you say you're fat... As someone who has struggled with disordered eating and fad dieting her entire life, I cannot tell you the amount of times I've been encouraged to just eat watermelon when people in my life would give me unsolicited weight loss tips. Similar to the grapefruit or celery diet, the idea is to starve yourself by eating foods that have no caloric value. And up until just a few years ago, as a society, we pretended these diets were completely fine and not just textbook disordered eating. Eating disorders often start in the home at the influence of a parent. There are frankly too many stories of young girls developing EDs because their mothers actively encouraged that behavior and gave them these unhealthy diet plans. Typically, the parent passing disordered eating down doesn't even realize they participate in disordered eating themselves. There can be a variety of reasons that a parent pushes an ED on their child. In the fictional case of Nadia, it seems this is in influenced by her mother's desire to stay skinny, and ultimately the desire to achieve or maintain thinness is most frequently the goal of disordered eating, which is almost always driven by fat phobia and society's mistreatment of fat people. We don't get the full backstory on Nora's disordered eating, but judging by Ruth's comments, we can assume it's because she doesn't want to be perceived as fat. In season one, when Nadia and Alan decide they have to get to the root of their guilt and face it head on, Nadia says she can't because her issues are directly related to her mother, who is now dead in the present. But in a last ditch attempt to admit what's been eating her up for so long, she finally allows her inner child to speak up and lays out her confessions to Ruth. Before this whole thing is over, um, I killed her. I took the easy way out. What easy way out? I told the social worker that I wanted to live with you and not with her, and then she was fucking dead within a year. You've got it all wrong. You said you wanted to live with your mom just like she told you to, but that just couldn't happen. No one was gonna let that continue. I don't think it matters. What are you talking about? Whatever I said, I wanted to live with you. It's insinuated that the day her mother smashed all the mirrors in the house was the last straw, causing Nadia to permanently live with Ruth. And whew, for any child who has ever lived with a parent who struggles with their mental health, the guilt that one can feel from not being able to save them or help them in some way can feel very, very heavy. Nadia, of course, did not kill her mother. She did absolutely nothing wrong and was simply existing as a child in unstable circumstances, and it was fortunate that she was put into Ruth's care. Mothers who are struggling through mental health crises rarely ever receive the support they need as a parent. Their grievances and challenges are ignored and criminalized when most of the time these parents could truly benefit from some outside help. This is explored in a 2012 study titled Experiences of Motherhood When Suffering from Mental Illness. Mothers with mental illness struggle with conflicting and distressing feelings related to motherhood. They seldom obtain the necessary support to increase their control over the determinants of their role as a mother, thus their opportunity of improving their own and their children's mental health is weakened. 
The mother's experiences were understood in their way of struggling to become good enough mothers, managing to become the mother they longed to be, being present in a caring relationship with their child, as well as being recognized as a mother and living openly and honestly in relationships with others. Addressing the existential needs of motherhood is important for their improvement and recovery, as well as for promoting their children's mental health and well-being. Russian Doll presents these mother-daughter relationship dynamics in a way that affirms both Nadia and Nora. Nora is never treated as a villain for her mental state and neither is Nadia. While Nadia is portrayed as detached from life and her relationship, Alan is portrayed as compulsive and controlling of his. He displays a lot of qualities of someone that might be experiencing severe anxiety or OCD. Initially, he's somewhat enjoying the death loop because he's been able to repeat his day over and over with absolute certainty of what will happen. He feels more in control than ever despite having to relive one of the worst days of his life. When Nadia goes looking for him and ends up at the jewelry shop that he bought Beatrice's ring at, the jeweler says he came in at least 20 time searching for the right ring. Alan already had a habit of reliving his days over and over, but this death loop gave him a level of control over his life that he had never experienced before. A small detail that I think exemplifies his behavior more than anything else is his decision to put on the same outfit over and over again. In season one, Nadia is always seen in the same outfit by happenstance. Alan, on the other hand, comes back to life in his bathroom bathroom immediately after having a shower and he makes the choice to get dressed in the same outfit over and over and he doesn't change that until he decides to go out on a limb and go to Nadia's birthday party. I think Alan is so content with the repetition of the loop because in his head he has the opportunity to change the outcome with Beatrice even though that was never going to happen. He frequently ignores the reality of his relationship always striving for an impossible level of perfection perfection in the hopes that his hard work and logic could change indescribable emotions. During Alan's first few respawns, he initially is only reliving the breakup with his girlfriend Beatrice, played by the strikingly beautiful Dasha Polanco. Usually when he sits her down to talk, he never allows her to finish her sentence. She says, Did somebody tell you? And he would finish her sentence with, That you're gonna break up with me. No. No, you did. Though, after Alan runs into Nadia, he's distracted and allows Beatrice to finish her sentence. Somebody told you about Mike? The... Mike? You slept with Mike? Revealing that she's been cheating on him with her professor, who is ironically the man that Nadia had a one night stand with in episode one. Alan doesn't know how to take this new information, but he's completely pissed that Nadia has thrown off his rhythm. He's frustrated by the fact that Nadia is a new, unpredictable outside factor, someone he cannot control nor anticipate. Hey look pal, I'm not so sweet on you either, okay? But right now, you're the only lead I've got. Lead? Yeah, you know, uh, clue. To get out of this, whatever this is, this situation. There is no way out of the situation. And personally, I liked it. I had control. I, I knew it was coming, and then you shut up and led me down this, this weird path like a carcinogenic siren. You're welcome. No, I'm, I'm not thanking you. You showed up, and everything ha has gone off. Alan spends the rest of his respawns coming into contact with the gingerbread man, as he calls him, lashing out on him, wondering why his girlfriend cheated with him in the first place. Instead of using these rebirths to consider his role in his relationship's failure, he focuses all of his rage on this professor, chasing after him for most of the season, having unproductive conversations. Listen, why you? Why me what? Be. She chose you, and you don't love her, you're not faithful. You never get punished. So why you? She didn't choose me, Alan. The only choice she made was not you. Nobody chooses me. I'm the whole where a choice should be.
He refuses to reflect on why Beatrice may not have been so happy by constantly stressing how much he's done everything right. He can't fathom why someone like Mike, who Alan perceives as a bad person, would be able to seduce his girlfriend, especially when he perceives himself as a good person. The series often plays with this question of morality, what gets constituted as good versus bad. Despite Alan's black and white perspective on morals, a recurring theme throughout the show is that there is no such thing as good or bad people. There are just people. We all have good and bad qualities. Of course, this isn't to suggest that these qualities are always balanced or that people can be resolved of their bad qualities simply because they have good ones. But the binary idea that there is such thing as a good or bad person, an idea that truly thrives under the constraints of white supremacy and colonialism, is thrown out the window here. Things are more muddy than that in this show. From the characterization of our protagonist and antagonist to the literal dialogue exchanged between them. Why do you think this is happening to us? I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's purgatorial punishment for being a bad person. What is this bad person? I mean, you know, there's Hitler and then there's uh, everybody else. Essentially, ideas of morality are presented as abstract and subjective in this show, which is a message I can always appreciate. One of the creators, Leslie Headland, has stated that she sees herself in Alan's journey, implying that his character was possibly meant to be queer-coded in season one, which is confirmed in season two. I relate with him so much because he reminds me of a particular time in my life where I was really denying who I was in order for, to present, and I'm sp speaking specifically about my sexual orientation, you know, like that I was like, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know if that's Alan's thing, but like, especially what he says in, in episode seven and, and, and the way he wants his mom to love him and, and the way he's so scared to give up on something that's so clearly not working um, was exactly how I felt in the world of, of um, trying to present as a heterosexual woman. There are so many reasons for someone to see themselves in Alan's character. For myself, I couldn't relate more to his intense anxiety and how he chooses to navigate it. For myself, I couldn't relate more to his intense anxiety and how he chooses to navigate it. Like I mentioned earlier, Alan is coded as a neurodivergent character. As someone who has struggled through severe anxiety previously being diagnosed with OCD, it's always refreshing to me to see a Black person navigate their neurodivergence openly and honestly. Alan is in a bit of denial about the status of his mental health, as shown when Nadia tries to suggest therapy with Ruth and he says, I don't need to go to see a therapist, no offense to you, but I People thinking that I'm crazy is one of my biggest fears. Clearly a descriptor, he also doesn't want to be labeled given how much negative stigma is carried with it. His decision to turn down therapy with Ruth could also be read as the discomfort many black and brown people experience in the field of Western psychological medicine. Within these dynamics, there's a cultural gap that prevents a level of comfort and trust necessary in mental health spaces. And then there's the reality that sometimes therapy doesn't work for everyone and there are other methods that people may want to explore. As kind and well-meaning as Ruth is, she may not be the best person to give Alan the advice that he's looking for. When he finally asks Beatrice why she wasn't honest with him, we get a very honest answer. How could you do this to me? It just happened and it got harder and harder for me to tell you anything. You're sensitive. If I said anything that wasn't in complete agreement or wildly encouraging, you were gonna lose your shit. Or maybe, I don't know, even hurt yourself. 
Beatrice's fears and concerns are not necessarily out of left field, given that Alan does in fact commit suicide on the first night that Beatrice ends the relationship. This scene also reminds me of the one with Nadia's mother, where we see Nadia affirming her, most likely influenced by that same sort of fear. Again, Alan and Nora are written to display some interesting parallels in their external relationships. The reveal that Alan's first death was a suicide is so heartbreaking to watch. On first viewing, I sobbed and sobbed because I just wanted to give him a hug. I appreciated this show's approach to suicide so much. We feel for Alan as the audience, but it's treated as something that's very matter of fact, no matter how upsetting. In the final episode, Nadia is tasked with preventing Alan from jumping off the roof and in a huge moment of relief, she is successful. Often our society and the media depicts suicide as a selfish, unreasonable action. Russian Doll never falls into this trope. Nadia doesn't convince Alan to stay alive by lamenting how his friends and family will feel about his decision. She tries to appeal to his own inner will to live, affirming that no matter what, she'll be there when he needs someone. There is no guilt, no pressure involved in this interaction, which is beautiful to see. There are a variety of reasons that someone may feel suicidal and our society doesn't allow people to be open and honest about those feelings. This show approaches the topic earnestly, never making Alan feel bad for his decision. It just holds space for him to choose life over death. In season one, Alan's character arc is mostly about him coming to terms with the things in his life that he's not happy about, to no longer fake the funk. This evolution comes to a climax at the end of season one, on Alan's final breakup with Beatrice, finally able to move into a moment of acceptance. He admits that he hasn't been okay for some time. For years I've just been, I've just been hollow. <laughs> you know, I, I thought if I, if I, if I worked hard enough, if I, if I, kept putting the time in and if I kept my head down, you know, did everything right, I, this aching, gnawing feeling of being an absolute failure would just, it would just go away. I know. And now I'm stuck with a body that is broken and in a world that is, that is literally falling apart and a mind that, a mind that wants to kill me. Alan's journey with his mental health as well as Nadia's were two of the most compelling themes for me to watch and is one of the reasons that I can't help but make this show a comfort show and want to go back to it over and over again. Russian Doll is such an ambiguous show, which is great because you're able to come to your own conclusions about how the world works. We could theorize for literally days about what each creative choice in the show really means, but this video is already long enough so I'll Give it a rest now. Uh, something that's sort of very personal to me is this idea that uh, underneath the surface, I think that, you know, uh, we're all sort of a little bit broken inside. And uh, yet we live in, in a society that's, um, you know, demands shame in a way for that very human experience. Uh, and in so many ways, you know, society is built in a f false you know, it's a, a house of lies. Um, you know, like if you get the right body or the right uh, car, or job, a boyfriend or whatever, somehow it's it's gonna be okay, that those are like the important choices in life. And I think uh, we find that it's, it's not quite as simple as that. You know, still we sort of have ourselves to contend with. And uh, in that sense, it's uh, I think a little bit more human and universal than it really just is. My story, it just uh, became a very kind of personal way in. So if this long ass video essay didn't get this across enough, I love this show, I'm such a huge fan. I think it's been executed so well despite having a few frustrations surrounding season two. Overall, it's a standout Netflix series for the subtle care it approaches such hefty themes with. With the steady decline of Netflix and them charging $16 for a standard subscription, who knows if we'll get a season three. If we do, I just hope they diversify the writer's room some more and we get to see much, much more of Alan.
Let me know what you thought about the show in the comments. I'd love to hear some of your own theories and analysis. If you enjoyed this dissection, give it a like and hit that subscribe button. Also, consider supporting this channel on Patreon. Monthly donations help me fund upcoming videos and sustain my work as a writer and artist. Thank you to all of my current patrons who helped fund this analysis. My name is Joe Donna and this has been With Nuance. I'll see y'all somewhere at some point. And something very weird happened where like in that death, like I kind of dropped out of myself and it almost felt like I was like flatlining in this weird way that I was like, when I came to, I was just like, oh yeah, no, we're good. Like, you know, <laughs> oh yeah, let's go again. That'll be great, great idea. Yeah, and a little more in the eyes, gotcha. And it was like this weird sort of like secret that I have myself of like, did I just fucking die? Like what? <laughs>